more schoolboy nine and i'm not gonna lie bro this has to be one of the weirdest shit most disturbing uh rabbit holes since like daily capper bro piper gate elsa gate it's basically this guy he lives in the uk and he's posting on instagram himself dressing up as a child and pretending to be a child all of this started because reddit users they were coming across these random ass reels and posts it was of multiple instagram accounts that looked similar to him but it had like actual kids but it looked like their faces were ai it looked like they had a makeup on with big lips red lipstick and they would always wear black heels and black leather mini boots but the kids will always be in poses so it's basically borderline all these accounts are all ran by smart school boy nine and there's multiple accounts there's od accounts bro and i've seen screenshots of those pages and that motherfucker smart school boy nine commenting on their real nah. life kids it's posting shit bro. it's already making me feel weird bro like he would also post videos of himself and there's one video in particular he's looking at himself in the mirror and he's basically getting off the fact that he's a kid it has to do with some weird fetish that he's obsessed with basically the other accounts are like in a way kind of outing himself by pretending to be somebody good yeah. exposing these but he's, but he's, he's him. exactly as of right now hasn't been no confirmed from what we know there's no well confirmed. there's victims because he definitely like got pictures from somewhere and shit like that just reminding me bro there's a video of him chasing an actual kid you're lying i'm being so serious nah bro nah <laughs> <laughs> Yo, you know how fast that motherfucker would have gone. I don't never slow up, no, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up. I don't ever slow up, no, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this, I'll always show up and make a statement. I don't ever slow up, no, I don't take shit. I got no love for the fakeness. If you wanna play tough and wanna hate this I'll always show up and make a statement Everything I do so instinctive and so passionate Every word I move so descriptive like an adjective I gotta vent better against people who patent it Being negative when you should be getting after it I got facts over facts over tracks This and that spitting slow, spitting fast I could roast, I could gas, think I'm okay at last But I don't know if that can erase all the past And the pettiness, a reflection of the emptiness Hilarious, you think you're worth my time, you're delirious Mysterious, because you hide behind a fake exterior Inferior, you know I'll always be a bit superior Get off of me, this ain't no humble brag I want you to hear words, you can say them back I want. At around 5pm, right before she was about to go home She decided to use the bathroom when she entered the cubicle, she noticed something she never saw before. Inside the toilet bowl was a black shoe. Yumi then decided to investigate further and stuck her head inside the sewer tank. And what she discovered scarred her forever. Inside the tank were a pair of human feet. She then screamed and her co-workers came running. Police came and discovered the feet were connected to a full body inside the tank. The body was difficult to move and firefighters and a crane had to assist in moving it. The body inside was 26-year-old Niyaki Kana and he was covered in feces and his cause of death was hypothermia. He was dead for three days and he got into the toilet pipes voluntarily and squeezed inside to spy on girls using the bathroom. This is absolutely disturbing and can you imagine going to the bathroom and then finding somebody inside the toilet looking at you? teenager was killed just one day after graduating. Lily Basil was a beautiful 18-year-old girl with an extremely bright future ahead of her. She was described by loved ones as the most kind person whose smile really lit up every room she went into. She had just graduated from Page High School in Franklin, Tennessee. However, the celebrations would be extremely short-lived and end in tragedy. On the 25th of May, following the celebrations, Lily was hanging out with a group of fellow graduates. A witness reported that multiple teenagers were just hanging out together, but that they had witnessed an 18-year-old guy called Matthew Rufail shoot Lily with a rifle. Now, after the shocking incident had occurred, it's believed that the witness actually took Lily to a local hospital in the car to try and get urgent medical attention. Matthew is believed to have also showed up at a hospital looking for Lily and admitted to killing her, but stated that he did not think that the weapon was loaded. 
He was arrested by police at the hospital and was charged with criminal homicide, but he was actually released on bail. Pedophiles created a deep web version of Kickstarter to crowdfund child corn. I'm not kidding, this is a real screenshot from a deep web pedophile website. This story was broken on the website called deep.web, which itself was seized and shuttered by the federal government. The owner was sentenced to eight years in prison, but apparently this was a website that covered deep web news stories. And this is just insane. Let me read you some of this. So on this post, this website, the administrator said, I'm going to read this to you. This site is the best method for child corn producers to sell their content. Before, it was almost impossible to make commercial grade child corn since as soon as they sell it to one person, that video was all over tour for free. This site aims to solve that problem by having many pedos each contribute a small amount of Bitcoin towards the video. Once the total contribution reaches the asking price, the video was released here on this site to everyone who contributed at least $20. And then right here under We Care, they say, Our biggest concern is the welfare of children who appear on this site. We have a zero tolerance policy for grape or even coercing an unwilling child to participate. Which is absolutely insane and this goes to show how insane and how fucked up and so disturbed pedophiles can be. They also say they won't allow children younger than three years on the website. I guess if they're four years old that's okay by their standards. And they also say that if you're a producer you must pay your child actors a fair wage. They then go on to say, the purpose of this site is so that your delicious lols can afford college, not so that you can exploit them for your own personal gain. I just could not believe that this is a thing. It made me realize how many of these websites are out there and it made me a little disturbed thinking about how many sites exactly like this are out there right now operating while you're scrolling on TikTok. It's seeing this kind of disgusting filth that makes me truly lose hope in humanity. If you want to join me on my journey to expose pedophiles, pedophile rings, and corruption, listen to my podcast, The Conspiracy Files. You can listen on all streaming platforms. We do extremely deep dives into subjects like this. Or you can watch the video version right here. And let me tell you, if you haven't seen this video, this will change your perspective on governments and how the world really works. This is part two of the disturbing case of Courtney Lynn Townsend. According to the Utah State Medical Examiner, Courtney's cause of death couldn't be determined because of how little remains were found, and they can't tell when she died either. But what's odd is that even though there is so little evidence left behind, authorities don't suspect foul play, and the Kane County Sheriff's Office isn't even investigating her death anymore. They said that one theory is that she was driving down the road that day, became high-centered on some rocks, which started a fire, and her death, however she may have died, was accidental. According to the police officer who found Courtney's car, it had snowed overnight, and when he looked located the car, it was cold to the touch, and there were no footprints in the snow, which means that it was burned some time before the snow fell. What needs to be investigated further is the fact that Courtney got married a month before she went missing, and according to her family and friends, the man was really abusive towards her. From an outsider's perspective, and after talking with Courtney's sister, it really seems like the police dropped the ball on this investigation, and this situation in specific. A friend of the family has gone on to hire a professional dog handler in hopes of locating more of Courtney's remains, but it wasn't what they found that was shocking, it was what they didn't. The friend didn't tell the professional they hired where the remains were found, and they did this so that they could hopefully get a fresh scent and pick up on more remains. But the dogs ended up searching the exact area where Courtney's remains were found, yet they didn't pick up on a single hit. No trace or scent of Courtney was found, which led this professional to believe that Courtney died elsewhere and the bones that were found were brought to that location by either an animal or person after the fact. Adding to this mystery is the fact that in February of this year, a backpack was found on a city truck in St. George that contained items that belonged to Courtney. She was a loving mom, and it included her kids' birth certificates as well as other personal items. At this point, it's believed that Courtney had already been dead on Cedar Mountain for some time. So how did her belongings get on this city truck so far away, and who put them there? That has never been answered, and it's one of the main reasons that Courtney's family can't get any closure. All evidence points to there being foul play, yet police aren't even investigating her death anymore, even though so many questions remain. There's a Facebook page called Justice for Courtney, which is run by her sister, and some pictures have been posted of the site where Courtney's remains were found. And it's just really creepy what has been left behind, like this plate that has Sledgehammer written on it. Someone in the group also looked up the exact coordinates of where Courtney's remains were found, and what's odd is that they found Google Earth images taken the day after her car was towed. You can see the burn marks in the ground, but what others are pointing out is that it looks like a woman is standing there. But who that person is, no one knows. It looks like she has brown hair and is wearing a black hoodie and blue jeans. This could be nothing, but it just doesn't seem like a coincidence that this was taken a day after her burned car was found. I just have so many questions in this case, like who those IDs belong to that were found near the burned car, and also what was inside the envelope that Courtney tried giving to the police officer. And more importantly, where's the rest of Courtney's body? Her family has created a GoFundMe to help finance and continue this independent investigation. 
so I'll leave that here. It's now been four months since she was found, but the circumstances surrounding her death remain a mystery. So you guys remember The Incredibles, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The thing that we didn't realize is the whole time, you see how Mr. Incredible defeated that robot? The very first robot he fights. Okay. Yeah. So apparently that robot wasn't even for him, bro. Because he defeated it. Who was it for? It's that just... robot was supposed to be for Frozone. Oh! Because oh, the girl was tracking both of them, but in real life. No, the girl was tracking Frozone the whole time. Because she said, oh yeah, he's with some fat guy. He's not alone. The fat guy's still with him. I never even noticed wait, that. Wait, wait, wait. He was the next target, bro. And then in the computer, when he's looking up locations, Elastigirl, unknown location, Frozone, known location. And and when he fought the robot, the robot literally led him to a volcano. What and bro, fuck? what would have Frozone done, bro? He would have died in that. Yeah, shit. it was too hot for him, bro. He would have died. Hey, it's just so like dark thinking about the fact that it's so planned to kill like these motherfuckers. And they killed so many of them, bro. If you literally watch how many, bro, it's like 17 plus, bro. And then you see that part where they actually find one of the bodies when Mr. Incredible is running away from Syndrome. Uh, yeah. He's running away from Syndrome and he jumps into the water. Oh, yeah. He ends up in his cave. Yeah, and then... This man survived an extremely brutal bear attack, and this is a massive trigger warning. In 2015, Chase Delwell was hunting with his brother in Montana when a worst nightmare situation happened. He came face to face with a male grizzly bear weighing up to 400 pounds. Chase only managed to walk backwards a few steps before the bear knocked him down and bit him directly on his head. After this, he bit Chase's leg and shook it around like a dog playing with a toy. The bear then tossed him in the air and continued to try and bite him. As the bear continued to attack him, Chase remembered a story that he read in a magazine once. And I quote, I remembered an article that my grandmother gave me a long time ago that said large animals have bad gag reflexes. So I shoved my right arm down his throat. Crazy enough, after Chase did this, the bear left and Chase escaped what was almost definitely certain death. Chase's brother then drove him to a hospital where he received treatment for gashes he sustained during the attack. Thankfully, he didn't sustain any life-threatening injuries and went on to a full recovery. But as crazy as it is, if he didn't shove his arm down the bear's throat, he would most likely be dead right now. Luckily, when he did that, the bear just didn't bite off his arm. Thankfully, Chase survived, and this story is absolutely mind-blowing. The man you saw in that video, Richard Ragland, went on to drown that day. And this GoPro footage actually captured his final moments of life. Before his death, Richard actually served in the National Guard. Everybody remembered him as having the biggest heart and being a very smart guy. However, on June 4, 2017, a freak accident would cause Richard to drown in the water he was swimming in in Georgia. To this day, nobody knows exactly what killed Richard or what forced him under the water, but his friends that were with him that day stated that he went under the water, they tried to help him, but there was no way they could get him back up to the surface. So after his death, Richard's family mourned their loss. But it wasn't until years later when a diver actually recovered that GoPro sitting at the bottom of that water. The diver's name was Rich Abernathy. He has a YouTube channel where he goes into bodies of water and dives. And he was diving in that same water in Tennessee when he came across a GoPro. And when he looked at the contents of that GoPro, the connection was made that this was Richard Ragland, the man who had drowned there only a few years prior. I'm going to play you a little bit more of that video. It is just some really haunting stuff. Being with brothers, being with brothers and sisters, we live in life. We live in life. We live in life. See, the thing is, one thing, one common goal that we all share is the same goal. <laughs> If you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. If I go missing after making this video, just know that it wasn't by my own doing. There's something horrific that has been and is currently going on in Utah involving a ritualistic sex ring, and it involves some pretty high-profile people. So in 2022, the Utah County Sheriff's Office announced that it was investigating a ritualistic sex ring that dates back to 1990. A bunch of old records were recently released by the Provo Police Department in which a woman, who has not been publicly identified, claimed that she was ritualistically abused as a child by Utah therapist named David Hamblin. This all took place in the 90s, and back 
then, David is working as a psychologist. The woman goes on to describe in graphic detail the ritualistic sex abuse that she experienced, as well as human sacrifices and a cannibalism cult that she firsthand witnessed. But that is not the only thing that the 151-page report uncovered. What's shocking is what came out because of the sheriff's office announcing this ritualistic investigation. David Lovett, who is a high-profile Utah County attorney, willingly and very publicly came forward without even being named and named himself a suspect in this investigation in late 2022. In a news conference, he said that there are leaked documents connecting him and his wife to allegations of cannibalism and murdering children. But he kind of chalked this up as a political ploy to get him out of office. But there's some pretty damning evidence that might prove otherwise. In the report, the unnamed woman accused David Lovett of sex abuse and participating in a ritualistic killing along with David Hamblin, the therapist. While denying this, David admitted to having a personal connection to David Hamblin. He said that David Hamblin was his elders quorum president in the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, and he was also his neighbor. David admitted to having a family connection with him. David Hamblin was actually arrested in 1999 for abusing the unnamed woman as a child, but charges were ultimately dropped for that in 2014. But yet, another victim came forward detailing the ritualistic abuse he suffered at the hands of David Hamblin as well. The victim, whose name is Brett, stated that he began seeing David Hamblin as a therapist in the 90s when he came back from his mission. Brett said that he was struggling internally because because he is gay, which at least back in the day, if not still, is opposed by the religion and the church. Brett came out to his bishop, who referred him to David because David had a history of quote-unquote curing people of their homosexuality. Each session, David would expose Brett to hypnosis therapy, and he even diagnosed him with multiple personality disorder as a result of experiencing ritualistic sex abuse as a child. This was really odd to Brett because he never remembered anything of the sort, but he went along with it because David was a licensed therapist. David would pretty much gaslight him into believing that he experienced these horrific things. But Brett became weary because he was never unconscious during any of the visits, and he surely never disclosed anything like this to David. This would continue on for two years, and on one occasion, David told Brett that as a child, his abusers tied him up in a black bag and left him there until he almost suffocated. And even though Brett really did not remember this happening, David said that they needed to reenact this in the office, which they ended up doing. This behavior would escalate until David reportedly made Brett expose his private area and perform sex acts on him in order to heal from his childhood trauma. Brett expressed not wanting to do this, but David said that if he didn't, he would never heal and always remain gay. After meeting with some of David's other patients, Brett and the others realized that they were all being put through the same abuse, and they never went back. Shortly after, David turned himself in and admitted to having intimate relations with his patients. He then gave up his psychologist license in 2000. He and his ex-wife are currently facing sexual assault charges from recent victims. The Utah County Sheriff's Office has interviewed more than 190 survivors of ritualistic abuse, and so much evidence has been discovered, including texts, phone calls, and emails. So you're probably asking how this all ties into today. Well, at the beginning of this year, the Utah State Legislator moved forward with a bill that would criminalize the ritualistic abuse of children, now making it a second-degree felony. I live in Utah, and I had no idea how common ritualistic abuse is, or even what it was, before reading these stories. I'm not a part of the church, so maybe I'm just living under a rock. But this bill would criminalize criminalize any of these horrific acts. Like, this includes sacrificing animals, mutilation of a corpse, ingesting human bones or blood, and making a child enter a coffin or an open grave containing a human corpse. This is all so twisted. Like, who thinks to do any of this stuff? I can't believe things like this actually happen. This stuff is straight out of nightmares. This teenager was brutally murdered, and the killers got away with it for years until a shocking robbery exposed the truth. Shafila Ahmed was a British-Pakistani 17-year-old girl from Bradford. It was 2003 and she had a bright future ahead of her. Shafila was living in Warrington, Cheshire and had dreams of becoming a solicitor. Unfortunately, her future was stolen away from her when she was brutally murdered. She'd had a traumatic childhood and suffered relentless physical and emotional abuse at the hands of her parents. Every single day, she was practically used as a punch bag by her mum and dad, and even her basic needs weren't being met. She was frequently locked in a room without food and water, and she had physical injuries all over her body. It was reported a teacher at school even noticed this on one occasion, when they saw that she had bite marks on her cheeks. Heartbreakingly, nothing was done, and when she turned 15, she applied to be fostered. Her application stated that the reason she wanted to leave home was, one parent hold me whilst the other hit me. Now, Shafelia had been so distressed by the abuse that she'd endured that on one occasion she even drank bleach. This was obviously an attempt on her life, and although she didn't succeed, she caused severe internal damage. She was having to take medication for this until she vanished. 
On September the 11th, 2003, her teachers rang police. They told them Shafelia was missing. Now, by this point, she'd already been gone an entire week. A huge search began for the missing teen. There were televised appeals for the girl, and locals joined in with the hunt. However, police started to fear that she'd been killed in a so-called honour killing. Theories started to develop about Shafelia and whether she had potentially been killed because she refused an arranged marriage. Her family were questioned, and her parents said that although an arranged marriage was on the cards, they weren't forcing her into anything. Then, in February 2004, a horrific discovery was made. The teenager's dismembered body parts were discovered in the River Kent. Now, due to the condition of the remains, it was too hard to determine a cause of death. Police conducted a search of Shafelia's family home and found a heartbreaking poem. It was written by Shafelia and described how trapped she felt. A friend of the teenager also came forward to state that she felt concerned with how Shafelia's mum spoke to her and treated her. Despite this, several members of the family were arrested and questioned, but later released without charge, frustratingly. Years ticked on, and it seemed like no one was going to be held accountable for her murder. That was until 2010, when an armed robbery took place on the 25th of August. Shafelia's younger sister, Alicia, had arranged an armed robbery at her parents' house. Alicia herself, her brother, sisters, and parents were all in the house when this took place. Three masked men with guns and hammers tied all of the members of the family up. They ransacked the house and left with money and valuables. When Alicia was eventually arrested for her part in orchestrating the robbery, what she told police was shocking. She admitted to police to having seen her parents kill her sister. She said they had tried to force her into an arranged marriage and she was resisting, so they suffocated her. Both parents were put on trial in 2012. They were found guilty of murder and sentenced to life imprisonment with a minimum term of 25 years. Alicia was given a suspended sentence for her part in the robbery and was placed in the witness protection program. This one is called the Oakland County Child Killer, and it's still an unsolved mystery. The killer has never been caught. Nobody knows who the killer is. It was a killing spree for kids ages from 10, 11, and 12. The thing about this, right, they were all found in public areas. They were either shot or strangled to death. And before they died, like autopsy and stuff like that showed that they were like nurtured and cared for before they died. Like they were bathed before they were killed. And like investigators are saying how like could be like some sick parent instinct. Like once that happened, they started creating a bunch of composite sketches what the guys could have looked like in and, uh, okay I do have two suspects that could be linked to this how did they get the suspects though okay so one of them uh, Archbeld Edward Sloan the reason why he was a suspect or whatever cuz he was a known child molester and they had investigated him and in his car they found like hairs that belonged to two of the boys and there was other hair in the vehicle too that didn't belong to him. So they basically said like, nah, it can't be him. So How does that make sense though? He could have been like an accomplice. But then there's another one named Chris Bush. Before one of the kids went missing, he was arrested and investigated for CP charges. And then and I think a couple years after, he ends up allegedly. But the way the crime scene looked, it looked like a fake, a fake. When they went in his house to investigate, there was no blood in the scene. His body was fully wrapped around, even his head. And then I have a picture that they took of his room. And there was something in the picture that kind of linked everything together. Right, right, right. right here on the left side, it's a hand drawing. And it's this picture. What and the they're thing? saying that it could be this kid. He's like screaming type shit, right? And police reports, that picture was never reported or, or anything. Like nobody mm -hmm. knew about it. They probably didn't even think about it. Or do you think like they were low-key in, in on it? When a doctor's decapitated head was discovered, police were horrified at the killer's identity. It was the 2nd of October 2022 in Westminster, Maryland. The wife of Dr. Magambe Pansuria was concerned. She phoned police to tell them there was absolutely no sign of her husband at home. There was, however, disturbing signs of a struggle. She told police there was blood all around the home. There was also a rug that had suspiciously gone missing from the laundry room. Police arrived at the property but wouldn't have to wait long until they heard devastating news. While officers scoured the property, dispatchers had another call. This time it was from a member of the public. The distressed caller was on Medford Road and reported a body lying at the side of the road. The body was dismembered and wrapped in a rug that matched the one that had gone missing from the house. Meanwhile, investigators found blood at the property in the garage and the bathroom. Blood was also found on the road nearby. Then, when the doctor's son, Ravi, came home, more shocking discoveries. 
He had come back in the family truck, which also contained blood and human tissue. Ravi himself was also found in clothing that had blood on it, and he was found in possession of a bloody hatchet. The blood was ultimately determined to be his father's. Just days later, investigators found his dad's head and hands in a creek. An autopsy confirmed that the victim had been stabbed 45 times. He suffered blunt force injuries to the head. Ravi was ultimately convicted of first-degree murder and was given life in prison without the possibility of parole. A motive for the crime is unknown. The victim was said to be a funny and generous man who loved gardening and had a real ability to connect with others. This woman accidentally got trapped in the back of a police car and this is one of the worst deaths imaginable explained. This was 56-year-old Clara Paulina and her husband was a longtime Miami police officer. Officer Paulino was working a night shift. So around 1 p.m. on August 21st, 2020, her husband was asleep in bed, so Paulino went out to his police car and was attempting to get something, but it's unclear what she was attempting to get. And when she climbed into the back seat, somehow the door closed behind her. I don't know if you've ever been in the back of a police car, but because arrestees always try and escape, they have mechanisms not allowing anybody to get out of the back seat and it automatically locks from the inside. So Clara was completely trapped. And it was a blistering 95 degrees outside that day. Clara didn't have her cell phone either and her husband was asleep. And the bar in a police car separating the back seat from the front seat was also locked. She could not reach through to honk the horn and alert anybody. So she sat in the back of this police car struggling to get out. She was banging on the windows, and they could tell she was because when they found her, she had bruises all on her wrists and hands. And they also found Clara's fingerprints all over the back seat, meaning she was touching every surface trying to figure out how to get out of this. And with the heat rising and her hyperventilating most likely, she may have also been losing oxygen. And sadly, hours later, around 5.30 p.m. that same day, her husband and her son found her dead in the back seat of the car. She had died from a heat stroke, and it's more than likely this death was very excruciating and long. It's almost as if Clara was literally cooked alive. And that's an awful situation I could honestly never imagine. Just imagine being that helpless in the back of the car when the heat is 95 degrees, and likely knowing I'm going to die from this. This is absolutely horrifying, and I also wonder who shut the door. Or how did it shut? Nonetheless, rest in peace to Clara. In the video I just showed you, 40-year-old Steven Weber was proposing to his girlfriend, Kanisha Antoine, in Tanzania. But Steven never resurfaced. Yes, just after proposing to his girlfriend, Steven drowned in that water and never came back to the surface. At the time, the couple had rented out an underwater hotel room. And that was when Steven had planned to ask Kanisha to marry him. So on the day of, while Kanisha was in the room, Steven went up to the surface, got his stuff ready, and hopped in the water. In the video, he takes out a note and presses it against the window. This side of the note reads, I can't hold my breath long enough to tell you everything I love about you, but everything I love about you, I love more every day. He then flipped the note over and the other side read, Will you please be my wife? And after that, he retrieved a wedding ring in a box from his swim trunks. In the video, he then swims off camera, but like I said before, Stephen never came back up to the surface. Obviously, this was a massive shock to everybody in this situation and just such a horrific accident. And in fact, later on, Kanisha would write in a Facebook post, You never emerged from those deaths, so you never got to hear my answer. Yes, yes, a million times, yes, I will marry you. This story is just horribly sad and one of those times truly when truth is stranger than fiction. I'm going to play the rest of the clip after this, but if you want to hear more true crime stories, listen to the podcast Murder in America that I co-host with my wife, Courtney. It's available on all streaming platforms. What does that say? Oh, it's so cute. <laughs> what? Remember, according to the phrase, you can't make this stuff up.
I have known the story of real life boogeyman, Albert Fish. A slight elderly man with gray hair, no one suspected the kindly single father of being sadistic, child, murderer and cannibal. This man murdered his girlfriend and then died of a heart attack while he was burying her. In May 2022, locals rang police after they noticed a man unresponsive in his garden. Police in South Carolina raced to the scene and they found the body of 60-year-old Joseph McKinnon. He was found lying next to a big hole in the ground that he'd been digging. It also became apparent that his girlfriend Patricia was missing. Now police tried and failed to get a hold of her and then eventually found blood in the pair's home. When they questioned her work colleagues, it turned out that she hadn't turned up to work that day and that was extremely unusual. When police did some further digging into the case, they discovered that actually the hole that Joseph was digging was a grave for Patricia. Joseph had attacked her and then wrapped her body up in bin bags. After killing her, he'd had a heart attack while trying to conceal her body. Nothing could have prepared me for the end of this story. So when I was little, I used to always complain about a scratching noise coming from the room next to me. My dad actually converted the guest bedroom next to my room into a home office and I was never allowed in there. He was a really busy man. One night I was lying in bed unable to sleep when I thought I heard a small sob come from his office. I could faintly make out the sound of a woman crying but I knew I wasn't allowed to go in there. And honestly at that point I was kind of too afraid to anyways. The next day I told my dad what I had heard and he told me it was probably just a bad dream. But that didn't make any sense to me because I knew what I had heard. My dad spent the entire day in his office that day. I didn't see him come out once. The next night, I waited until my father was asleep and I did what I knew I shouldn't do. I went into his office and when I opened the door, there were no books, there was no desk, there wasn't even a single chair. Just scratched into the walls a million times. Help me. These are three California creatures you never heard about. Up first is the Dark Watchers and they're usually sighted in the mountains of California and are described as tall, featureless, dark silhouettes, often wearing brimmed hats and having walking sticks. If you ever see a dark watcher, whatever you do, never approach it, because if you do, you will completely vanish forever. Next is Tahoe Tessie, who is a water creature and is living in Lake Tahoe. It's been described as having smooth skin and is apparently so big it's the size of a bus. So next time you go to Lake Tahoe, you better look around for Tahoe Tessie. Finally is the Lone Pine Devil. This is also a creature who is often sighted in the mountains of California, and it's described as a large creature with both bird and reptile qualities. They have razor sharp claws and venomous fangs. So what creature do you think the creepiest is? In my opinion it has to be the Dark Watchers just because of how creepy and weird they sound. But either way, let me know which one is the scariest to you. Whatever you do, do not look into her eyes. My father locked me in our basement for 11 days and claimed not to know I was there. My name is Charles Bothwell V. I was 12 years old in 2014 when my father, Charles Bothwell IV, still had custody of me and mistreated me. In June 2014, my father reported me missing. The police conducted an intensive search, but eventually I was found hidden in the basement of the family home, approximately 11 days after being reported missing. I lived in inhumane conditions, my parents deprived me of food, subjected me to repeated abuse and violence and cut me off from all social contact. My father even pleaded for public assistance on television during my supposed disappearance, while he himself was the perpetrator. The case took a shocking turn when investigators discovered that my father was aware of my presence in the basement. Both my father and mother were arrested and charged with severe parental neglect. 
Investigators also found evidence of abuse against me. I was subsequently placed under the custody of Child Protective Services. My father was then sentenced to 18 months probation and ordered to take anger classes, and he will no longer be allowed to approach or contact me. I threw my baby from the fourth floor. My name is Sonia Hermosillo, and I was 42 years old in 2011 when I committed the worst act. I had three children, including two little girls, and my baby No Medina, a seven-month-old boy with autism. My husband and my daughter had already noticed that since the birth of my son No, I had a different behavior. His illness and various health problems, such as the flat head that required him to wear a helmet all the time, had particularly affected me, and I often neglected the way I took care of him. That's why my husband decided not to leave me alone with our baby, but I took advantage of the fact that he was in the shower to take him and leave with him. That day, he was supposed to undergo tests at the hospital, so I drove there, and once I arrived, I parked on the fourth floor of the parking lot. Once out of the car, I thought that throwing him from the top of the four floors might be a good idea to see if he could survive. So I took him, removed the helmet he was supposed to wear, and threw him, and he died instantly. I was quickly arrested by the police. Once arrested, I said that all of this was due to mental problems. I confessed to the police that I killed him because of the problems he had. I was then sentenced to 25 years in prison without parole. This is the time I was almost abducted by a serial killer. In February of 2012, I went to go visit my grandfather's grave for his birthday. His death was a pretty hard thing for me to process as he only died in March of 2011, so it was all still pretty new to me. I was kneeling in front of his grave crying and thinking to myself when all of a sudden I looked up and see a man running at me full speed from the woods in front of me. I was able to get myself to my truck pretty quickly before he got to me, but by the time I got in the truck, he was only about 50 feet away. I got in my car before he could get to me and locked the doors much to his displeasure. He like threw his hands up as if he had lost a football game. I started my truck and started driving out as fast as I could, but not before I passed him. I didn't break eye contact with him the entire time I was driving past, so I got a really good look at him. So cut to a few years later, I'm pretty bored at work, so I download this random app that has a bunch of paranormal, UFO, cryptid, and serial killer stories on it. And as I'm browsing through stories, I come across one that makes my heart absolutely drop. There was a photo of a man I recognized very well. Israel Keys, who was most known for murdering an underage girl in Alaska, dismembering her, and throwing the pieces of her body in a lake. He would bury kill kits in places long before he ever committed the crimes. He had been killing for a few years, to the point where no one really knew what his actual death toll was. And he would eventually go on to take his own life in prison. At the end of this book I read about him, they mentioned his favorite places to abduct people. Public parks and cemeteries. I often wonder if he left any kill kits in that cemetery. You were fast, Israel, but I was faster. This abandoned prison is straight out of a nightmare. Welcome to the Mid-Orange Correctional Facility in Warwick, New York. Originally opened as a reform school for boys, this sprawling complex was eventually turned into a prison for men. And over the years, it housed a number of deplorable criminals from New York State, including an infamous serial killer. As you walk the halls of this crumbling complex, you can feel the energy. You can feel the souls reaching out to try to talk to you. One of the more infamous spirits that haunts this property is that of a teenager named Jimmy. Obviously, back when this was a reform school for boys, abuse was rampant in these halls. And one teenager named Jimmy decided to take his own life by hanging himself in one of the buildings out back. Now, I can tell you from first-hand experience that this place is definitely haunted. I spent the night there ghost hunting while filming an episode of my show with the New York Post, which is available on YouTube now. And you could just feel the energy of these buildings emanating. I mean, there were a number of crazy historical things that happened here in these buildings, including a riot. And obviously, tons of people lost their lives here over the years. I mean, the Mid-Orange Correctional Facility was known as one of the most violent prisons in the state of New York. And every single part of this complex is haunted, including this eerie church that was left abandoned after the building was closed. When this building sat empty for years, rituals were performed by people that broke in here. And the dark energy from these rituals still remains. If you want to see the full video that I filmed here, just head to the New York Post's YouTube channel. And for more spooky content, follow me on YouTube at The Paranormal Files. This baby was kidnapped and then the parents received the wrong baby back. In April 1964, Dora Fronzak gave birth to baby Paul. Although this should have been one of the happiest days of her life, it soon escalated into a nightmare. Paul was kidnapped. 
A woman posed as a nurse and using her fake profession, she managed to steal Paul from the Chicago hospital. Word spread that the baby was missing and 600 homes were frantically searched. Paul's parents made devastating pleas for his return. Now, police only had Paul's ear shape and blood type to go off. However, they did soon find an abandoned child in New Jersey. When Dora saw him, she was incredibly relieved. She had baby Paul back and that would be the last of it for 10 years. One Christmas when he was hunting for presents, 10 year old Paul discovered a memory box and inside this box were news clippings from his kidnapping. When he confronted his mom about this, she shut the conversation down, but it stayed in the back of his mind. Paul started to have doubts about his true history. In 2012, he did a DNA test and the result shocked everyone. Paul was not the Paul who'd been kidnapped. He wasn't biologically related to either of his parents. Now, sadly, his parents were actually furious at Paul and they refused to speak to him for a year. In 2015, Paul discovered that he was actually born as Jack and he had a twin sister, Jill. His biological mum had a drinking problem and his dad was a violent man. Meanwhile, the FBI ended up reopening the case of missing baby Paul. It was actually another home DNA test that revealed where he was. A man named Kevin Beatty was actually missing baby Paul. Now the woman who raised him had actually passed away. So some mystery still remains about missing baby Paul. Tragically in 2019, Dora actually arranged to meet her long lost son, Kevin. However, before the pair could reunite, Kevin actually died of cancer. Paul's twin sister, Jill, is still missing. He continues to look for her and you could actually help solve this cold case. By taking home DNA tests and uploading your information onto jedmatch.com, we can all help to solve cold cases. This is the backpacking beheadings, the tragic case of Louise Jesperson and Marie Newland. Before Louise Jesperson and Marie Newland embarked on their journey to Morocco, Louise posted on Facebook letting her friends know she would be making a trip to Morocco and was asking anyone out there if they knew about Mount Tubcol, and the theory is this post put the attackers on high alert and apparently how the girls would become targets of the attackers. Nobody knows how true this is, but it's the leading theory. But the girls continued on their journey and eventually as night fell, they set up camp to rest. During their hike, it's believed the attackers were stalking their victims, waiting for them to stop, waiting for them to get further away from civilization. And once this happened, the attacks ensued. The attack was brutal and both Luis and Marine were brutally beheaded and some reports even claim the girls were sexually assaulted. The murder of Luis Jesperson was recorded and posted online. It's believed Marie Newland was murdered first but there's no video of that, though people online claim it's out there. The video starts with Luis Jesperson lying on her stomach and she's wearing a t-shirt and underwear. And almost immediately the terrorist attempts to behead her. But he starts from the back of the neck and that usually isn't the way to do it. Right when he cuts, Luis says ow and begins to scream, and apparently in her native language she was begging for her mother. Once the man beheading her realizes it's hard to behead someone from behind, he then turns her over and one of the people he was with stomps on her face to hold her down and he then starts beheading her from the neck. And at this point, there's a lot of blood and a lot of screaming and gurgling. He then begins hacking at her neck to complete the beheading and once he's beheaded Luis Jesperson, he picks up her head and takes it to her tent and places it inside and the video concludes. It's a quick video, but it's extremely bloody, extremely horrible, and extremely sad. It's definitely one of the worst beheadings I ever covered, mainly because these girls were very young, very naive, and didn't deserve what happened to them at all. One of the girls even posted how the world is safe and that we shouldn't judge people, and it's super sad that they paid the price of this with their life. Please don't go looking for this video because it will stick with you forever and it's really not worth it. Rest in peace to Luis Jesperson and Marie Newland. This is one of the most dangerous men in Canadian history, Shane Pattinson. And while he doesn't really look it on the outside, he really is a dangerous and twisted man. So in 2012, Shane was sentenced to five years in prison because he had collected over 4,500 CP images depicting the extreme essay of young girls under the age of five, 4,500 images. So he served most of his prison sentence and he was released in 2015 and was immediately sent to a halfway house with the Salvation Army. But just shortly after getting out of prison, when he went to the halfway house, investigators performed a routine check-in on him and what they found was extremely shocking. 
When investigators checked in on Shane, they walked into the room. They found him naked from the waist down. He had three devices open, each of them displaying CP images. And he was actively toying with himself at the time that they walked in to these images. When these investigators performed searches on what Sheen had in his room, they discovered that in the short time he was out from prison, he had already accrued thousands of additional CP images and was actively sharing them with other users across the internet. This means that he served his first sentence for CP possession. He got out and almost immediately went back to collecting it and obsessing over it. And like I said before, this guy had thousands of victims across the planet and he was working his way into the dark web to connect with other pedophiles across the world. Now Shane has a pretty disturbing life story. When he was only three years old, he allegedly played mommy and daddy with a four-year-old cousin of his, a game which turned graphic, if you know what I mean. He then stated that his great-grandfather sexually abused him for years until he hit puberty. And he said that he first started viewing CP images when he was only 14 years old. He also stated that when he was just 14 years old, he essayed an eight-year-old friend of his sister's. He also told interviewers that he was intensely aroused by smelling women's undergarments and by sniffing dirty, soiled diapers. So he was eventually sentenced to seven years in prison, but with his time served, he was actually only given five and a half years. And this happened back in 2018, which means if it all worked out in his favor, this year, Shane Pattison will be released from prison. And after reading this dude's story and learning about what he does, I do not think that he's going to be able to live in a normal society. I don't know how or why he's being released so quickly, but I'm just really afraid for what's going to happen when he's out next. This is the 10 days of horror that shocked Pennsylvania. On the 5th of July 2017, Jimmy Patrick left his house. He was a student living with his grandparents and he was going to Cosmo Dinardo's house to buy marijuana. Cosmo had a history of schizophrenia and had been sectioned the year prior. He was known to police and had been arrested for possessing a gun. Now this was illegal due to his mental health issues. Jimmy got to Cosmo's house, which was in a remote location. As he got out of the car, Cosmo shot him. He then dug a hole and buried him. The following day, when Jimmy never came home, his granddad reported him missing. Meanwhile, Cosmo was planning other drug deals. He agreed to meet with another student, 19-year-old Dean Finocchiero. Before picking up Dean, he picked up his cousin, Sean Kratz. Now, Sean was also known to police and he had many arrests due to theft and robbery. The pair decided to rob Dean instead of selling him substances. Again, Dean was shot and killed at the farmland. They wrapped him in tarp and put him in a metal tank. The same day, Cosmo met Thomas Mio and Mark Sturgis while his cousin stayed at the property. When they got back, Cosmo shot Thomas as he got out of the truck and he fell to the ground. Mark tried to sprint away, but Cosmo shot him and killed him. Cosmo then ran over Thomas with his truck, crushing him to death. He put the two bodies in the metal tank and poured petrol over them and set them alight. That evening and the following day, more of the parents reported their sons missing. Cosmo then contacted somebody in order to sell them Thomas's car. Meanwhile, however, police were tracking the cars of the missing boys. They found Thomas's car at Cosmo's family home. Cosmo was questioned but lied his way out of this. On day six of the investigation, police tracked one of the missing boy's phones to Cosmo's family home. Cosmo was arrested on firearms charges and his bail was set to $1 million. His dad actually paid 10% of this in cash and Cosmo was free. Police then managed to re-arrest Cosmo because of the fact that he tried to sell a missing boy's car. Shortly after, police discovered the bodies of three of the boys on the property. Cosmo confessed to police and then told them where to find Jimmy's body. He got four consecutive life sentences and his cousin, Sean, got life in prison plus 18 to 36 years. On March 17th in Pensacola, Florida, bridge worker Mason Ponder came across an unusually heavy suitcase. He had no idea that it contained the body of Gannon. Here's his testimony in court. I was the first one to unzip it. <clears throat> And before we opened it, as soon as we unzipped it, we immediately noticed the smell. That's what hit us first. <clears throat> I remember looking up at Matt, who's quite a bit taller than me. Um, and I said, Matt, I think there's there's something dead in here. And unfortunately, we do come across sometimes somebody will throw out 
a litter of puppies or something in a bag and you know it's that's not uncommon and it just it smelled but it was so strong it, it was just it was different that day <clears throat> so i didn't initially open it and we kind of thought about what we were going to do first <clears throat> When we finally went ahead and unzipped the rest of it, the the, the smell was so overpowering. We, you know, we kind of stepped, took a step back, and the first thing I remember seeing was just two little feet, and that had little football socks on them. The best I remember that's I remember to be in little socks on them, and before I could, before anything else happened, I couldn't really make out what it was. Um, Matt dumped the suitcase over, and of course, we initially uh, immediately knew it was a body. Um, but after looking at it, it was um, we, we couldn't tell male or female, um, boy or girl. We just we didn't know. Um, a lot of black hair. Gannon's autopsy revealed blunt force trauma to the head, a gunshot wound to his jaw, and twelve separate stab wounds. This eleven-year-old boy had suffered horrifically at the hands of his evil stepmother. Letitia was charged with the murder of Gannon and faces a total of 13 charges, including first-degree murder, child abuse causing death and tampering with evidence. In 2022, Letitia changed her plea from guilty to not guilty by reason of insanity, stating that she was insane at the time of Gannon's murder. This delayed the start of a trial because she had to be evaluated multiple times to determine the state of her mental health. In March 2023, the jury was selected and Letitia's defence claimed that the latest sanity report showed her to be insane at the time of Gannon's murder, claiming that she suffered a major psychotic crack at the time of the brutal killing. The state, however, have argued that the fact she tried to cover the crime up so well and throw off the police shows that she knew right from wrong. The trial continues and you can follow it live over on Law and Crime. Pure evil or mentally ill? In 2012, when Zachary Davis was just 15 years old, he entered his mother's bedroom in the dead of night and struck her over the head 20 times with a sledgehammer. Did you kill your mother? Yeah. And why did you kill her? She uh, wasn't taking care of my family. And where did you hit her? In the head. Where was she when you did this? She was uh, asleep. You've got a sledgehammer in one hand and you open that door, what's going through your head at that moment? My mind was pretty much blank. I could just hear the hammer hitting her head. And what did it sound like? There was this uh, wet thumping sound. <laughs> Zachary was a very quiet child. He lived with his parents and his older brother Josh, but when he was just nine years old, his dad died from Lou Gehrig's disease, and it sent Zachary into a downward spiral. He was seen by a psychiatrist and diagnosed with schizophrenia and depressive disorder, and he started therapy. During therapy, Zachary went through the first two phases common in the bereavement process, numbness and depression, but he never made it to the third, recovery. His mother Melanie pulled him out of therapy after just four sessions and moved the family to Tennessee, thinking that they were starting a new life. Melanie worked as a paralegal and tried her best to provide a life for her two boys, but Zachary was becoming more and more withdrawn. By the time Zachary was 15, he was a complete outcast at school. He often spoke in whispers and wore the same hoodie every day pulled up around his face. He had an app on his phone about serial killers and another list of torture devices. Zachary showed absolutely no signs of violence outwardly, but beneath the surface, something awful was bubbling. August 10th, 2012 was like any other day. Zachary, his brother and his mum went to watch a movie and then when they got home, Melanie went up to bed. Once Zachary was sure that his mum was asleep and after his brother had also gone to bed, he grabbed a sledgehammer from the basement, went into his mother's room and started hitting her over the head, again and again, 20 times in total. Melanie actually woke up after the first blow and started gasping for air. She then started to experience seizures while her son hit her over the head again and again until he was sure she was dead. He then went to the family's game room where he doused it in petrol and whiskey and set it on fire, intending to kill his brother Josh. The only problem was that he'd shut the door to the game room and the fire didn't spread as quickly as he'd hoped. Josh escaped and went to a neighbour's house. Zachary was found 10 miles from home and on his arrest he said, 
I didn't feel anything when I killed her. Zachary's trial for the murder of his mother began and when he was asked if he could go back in time, would he do it again? He smirked and said, yes, and I'd kill Josh with the sledgehammer too. Zachary showed absolutely zero remorse in the courtroom, but his defence argued that he'd been hearing his father's voice and had been told to kill his mother. His grandma also testified that he hadn't got the help that he needed as he was mentally ill and he's not a monster. He's a child that made a terrible mistake. But after hearing from Zachary himself, the jury weren't so compassionate. He laughed when he described how heavy the murder weapon was and took joy in describing the sound it made when it hit his mother's head. He was asked why he'd hit her so many times and his response was, I wanted to make sure she was dead. The jury deliberated for just three hours before reaching a guilty verdict. Zachary was sentenced to life with a minimum of 51 years, meaning he'll be in his mid-60s when he's eligible for parole. Imagine getting married only to be decapitated by your husband three months later. 21-year-old couple Jared and Angie got married in October 2022. Around 4pm on the 11th of January, police were called to their home in Texas. Police made a grim discovery in the pair's bathroom after finding, quote, what appeared to be the head of the victim to be in the shower, end quote. Angie's body was discovered on the floor near the bed in a pool of blood with multiple stab wounds to her back. It was actually Jared's poor parents that initially made this discovery after entering the home. They then obviously alerted police to what they found. Jared was arrested and has confessed to killing his wife with a kitchen knife. Jared was actually captured on CCTV, casually stealing a bottle of beer from Angie's workplace just minutes after it's believed that he killed her. Angie's friends have reported to police that the couple's relationship was toxic and Jared was very controlling. Jared's bond is currently set at $500,000. This schoolboy stabbed his teacher to death in front of a classroom full of students. 61-year-old Anne Maguire was a Spanish teacher teaching in Leeds. She'd actually worked at the school for 40 years and she was only five months off retirement. However, in April 2014, something absolutely horrific happened. One of her students was 15-year-old Will Cornick. He'd always been described as a smart student who never really caused any trouble. Classmates regarded him as a polite student, but after he got diagnosed with diabetes, his personality seemed to change. In 2013, he tried to join the army, but because of his diagnosis, he was rejected. Being in the army had been his dream, so this was really upsetting for him. After failing to complete his Spanish homework, he was given detention by Anne. He also expressed a wish to her that he wanted to drop Spanish, but she wouldn't let him, which only angered him more. He began to develop a deep-rooted grudge against Anne. Shockingly, he reportedly messaged his friends on Facebook asking if one of them would kill her for him for £10. During one school day, halfway through his Spanish class, Will decided to get up and attack Anne with a knife. The classmates watched on in horror as he chased her out of the classroom. When there, another teacher heard her screams and tried to shield Anne from any more blows from him. Will then allegedly returned to his class and told his classmates how it was a shame that he hadn't killed her. However, Anne did actually pass away from her injuries. Will later admitted that he did plan also to kill two other teachers. One of them was actually pregnant at the time. He's been sentenced to life in prison with a minimum of 20 years. This is one of the most horrific cases I've heard recently, so please be warned before watching. 29-year-old Taylor Parker has just been sentenced to death for a crime so horrendous that I can't believe a human is capable of this. Regan Simmons Hancock and Taylor had met online. Their online friendship soon blossomed into a real life connection. It was 2022 and Regan was married with a young daughter. She was also eight months pregnant at this time. Taylor was also pregnant, or so it would seem to the outside world. She was posting pregnancy pictures on social media and even hosted a gender reveal party. Little did her loved ones know that she was actually staging the entire thing. Regan and Taylor were really good friends around this time and they were bonding over their pregnancies. 
Regan even shared a Facebook status thanking Taylor for bringing her around a gift and Starbucks. This was the day before she would be murdered by Taylor. On Taylor's supposed due date, she made her way round to Regan's house in Texas. Shortly after, Regan's mum made a horrifying discovery. Her daughter was face down on the floor, deceased with blood everywhere. Her mum rang the emergency services and they raced to the scene. It became apparent that her baby had been, and again, a massive, massive trigger warning here, ripped out of her stomach and Regan had been stabbed over a hundred times. Meanwhile, Taylor was pulled over for speeding and driving erratically. She'd actually put the baby in her lap with the umbilical cord coming out of her trousers to make it seem like she'd just given birth. When the pair were taken to hospital, the horrors of what actually happened became apparent. The newborn baby tragically passed away and Taylor was arrested. She was sentenced to death, but her defense lawyer said that her loved ones should have done more to protect her earlier on when she was pretending to be pregnant.